Hi everyone, this is Heather Lachman from the Flourish Academy. Today is our weekly Q&A and there are some fantastic questions that I am looking forward to answering this morning. I'm going to start with the first one from my friend Christine. She says, embarrassing question because it seems so basic, but I don't really think it is Christine. She says, but I always struggle with the best, all caps, best positioning of a subject in a sunset setting. I have not perfected this quite yet. And then Brooke replied and said, yes, please. I feel like I struggle finding the spot where the light is gorgeous, but not right in their eyes. So when photographing a sunset, you really have to start by establishing your goal. What is your goal of the image? Is it subject or is it the sunset? And do you have off-camera lighting or on-camera lighting? Do you want to use lighting? So number one, I would recommend establishing your goal. What do you want, <clears throat> excuse me, the photo to look like? I was working with my friend Hannah yesterday. We were shooting a newborn and she was helping me by swaddling the baby because she is a master baby wrangler. And she was swaddling the baby and positioning him. And I said, no, could you put him this way a little bit? And she said, okay, what is your goal? Tell me your goal for this photo. <laughs> it's actually quite funny. So that's what I always start with. In regards to sunset, what is the goal? Okay, I would assume that the goal, one of the goals, is to get a pretty photo of the sunset. Well, it depends on that particular sunset. As you know, they're all different. Sometimes the sunset is most beautiful in the same direction the sun is, so that would be the west, and the sky looks really pretty. But if it's a stormy day or after a storm, you might notice that the sunset is much prettier in the east or opposite of where the sun is setting. And this makes a difference in terms of, obviously, where you position the subject. Once I get my subject positioned relative to what I want the background to look like, I have to make a determination. Is this a silhouette image? Do I, am I focusing on the sky? Am I making this amazing sky? Or is this an image of the subject? So if it's a silhouette image, I'm going to expose for the sky. So I'll just take a test shot of just the sky and I'll dial it in until that sky looks perfect. So that's how I'm going to begin. <clears throat> take a test shot of the sky. Then I position my subject where I want them. If I take that photo, it will always be a silhouette because when you expose for the sky, you're going to be underexposing to bring out all of those beautiful colors and then your subject will be in the shadow. So then you have to make a decision as to whether or not, <clears throat> goodness, excuse me, as to whether or not you want to light the subject. So are you gonna put a flash on your camera? Are you going to put a flash off the camera and light your subject in addition to exposing for the sky? I mean, those are just questions you have to determine at the time. I would start simple. If you're new to sunset photography, I would go photograph sunsets, sans subject. So no people, just photograph beautiful sunsets and get the hang of that. And then place people in the photo and work on so a lot of shots in the sun. So put your subject there. You, good morning, Stephanie, thank you. So you would put your subject there, expose for the sky, and you would have a silhouette. Then you should determine whether or not you wanna light your subject and you would use a flash. I hope that you found that helpful. If I need to clarify more, um, just provide me with more data. You know how I always say, I need more data. But I think probably what you're going for is a nice photo of the sky, I would assume. The next question is from Dana. She says, what's a goal you didn't reach? How did you adjust that goal for the next year, month, etc.?" Oh my goodness, do I love this question. So my friend Dana and I work together quite a bit. I've mentored her, I mean, fairly extensively. She knows that I'm very goal-driven as she is. By the way, as an aside, Dana just left her employment. She was a pharmacist and she is now at home with her two small children and she's doing photography as a business, sort of part-time and on the side, but she intends to grow it as the children get older. So we're very goal-driven. So I read this question yesterday and I thought, okay, what's a goal I didn't reach and how did I adjust? I have been thinking about this since she posted the question. I cannot come up with a goal I didn't reach. And I think the reason is because there is no such thing as bad goals. There's only bad timing. So there's no such thing as unreachable goals. 
you just have to adjust when you're going to reach that goal because I'm, I mean I'm really struggling here I really believe that I have hit all of my goals when I've wanted them I have certainly adjusted goals if I find that I'm going in a wrong direction and I don't like where I'm headed I have dropped goals no that's just not gonna work out for me uh, oh I did have a goal I think this was either earlier this year or late last year I thought Oh, it would be fun to start a podcast. So I'll do a podcast. Maybe I'll have Leanne do that with me. And we talked about it a little bit. I started to look into it. I set it as a goal. And then I decided this goal was not right at this time. Uh, I wasn't interested in it. I would much rather connect with you on video than just audio providing you information. So I dropped that goal. But I wouldn't say it was because I couldn't reach it. I decided I didn't want it. Uh, my other goals that I set, I always seem to hit, usually ahead of time. Occasionally, there's a goal I set that I don't hit what I think I should, but ultimately, I hit it. So, um, Dana, that was a great question. You have to determine if it's not working out. If you set a goal and it's not working out, you have to determine, is it the right goal? And if the answer is yes, then you have to say, well, is it the right time? Or do I need to adjust the time frame that makes a little bit more sense? For instance, if you decide to leave your corporate job or just start a photography business off the ground. Hi, Brooke. Hi, I see you. Good morning. If you decide to start a photography business just off the ground and you say, I have a goal to make six figures in sales this year, mm, it's not that that's an unrealistic goal. It's unrealistic time frame. It's probably pretty unlikely that you're going to hit six figure sales in your first year out of the gate, especially if you've never picked up a camera or worked on your photography business. So you just have to adjust the time frame, right? It doesn't make sense to say six figures in one year. Maybe next year, maybe uh, my second year in photography business, I am going to hit six figure sales. And by the way, I have seen people do that, but these are the top of the best. These are aggressive, ambitious, driven people that will hit six figure sales their second year in business. I've seen other people hit six figure sales three and four years in, some five and six years in, some never, but they might not even desire it. Oh, good morning, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. So it really depends on the goal, the desired outcome. Do you have clarity around the goal? Is it the right goal? And what is the time frame? So I just want you to remember there's no such thing as unrealistic goals, only unrealistic time frames. Oh, I learned that a couple years ago and I love it. Dana also asks, was there a turning point for you that you felt more confident, and then she put competent, because I talked about that in a video a few days ago over on the Flourish Academy page, check it out. So she says, was there a turning point that you felt more confident or competent in your photography? Not necessarily business related, but artistically speaking, and Kim said, yes, I'm dealing with this too. And absolutely, there's certainly an inflection point where something happens that you feel more confident. But to be honest, Dana, it just takes time. Practice, practice, practice. And the reason is, when you practice, the more different types of situations you'll find yourself in, you'll overcome them, and you'll gain more confidence because you'll feel more competent. So, you know, your first couple of weddings, uh, you might do well, you might not have any major issues, and then you shoot another wedding and something sort of strange happens. Maybe the time frame is unrealistic. Maybe the church lady kicks you out of the church. Maybe there's horrible weather. Maybe some of your gear fails. Something happens, and you figure out a way to overcome it. Well, situations like that, that compound over time to lead to confidence. So it's not one particular thing. I remember, this is several years ago, I had a friend that I was mentoring and she called me panicked from a wedding, panicked. Like she's in the back room at the church because her pocket wizards were not working, the flashes were not firing. I said, okay, take a deep breath, this is what I want you to do. And we went through a series of troubleshooting tips. She figured out the problem, she got her flashes working, everything was fine. And the next day we were sort of debriefing about it and she was like, hi, I mean, that was just so stressful and overwhelming to me. And I said, I have great news for you. Do you wanna know what the redemptive quality of that situation was? Because she couldn't see it. She just felt really bad about the whole thing. It worked out, it was fine. I said, the redemptive quality is 
that will never happen again <laughs> because now you know how to troubleshoot those particular pocket wizards and what could potentially go wrong. So that happens just over time. Practice, 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 as Malcolm Gladwell says, 10,000 hours. So 10,000 hours, hundreds of sessions, years of weddings, and you gain confidence. It's not something that happens overnight. And while, while there does feel like there's an inflection point, looking back, I can see that inflection point, but in, in the time that it was occurring, I did not. It's just time. Over time, you'll feel more confident. You need to love your work. So in order to love your work, you need to get it where you want it to be. And that starts with defining and getting clarity around who you are as a photographer. Developing your photography style coupled with your editing style will make you who you are. So getting those down and being sure of them will give you confidence. In the beginning, when you're sort of dabbling with all different types of sessions, all different types of styles, you are editing differently. Um, I'll see some people brand new, they'll post a gallery and literally every photo will be edited differently. And I think that's great by the way, because they're learning, they're practicing with different styles, but ultimately your goal should be when you deliver a gallery that it looks consistent and that's your editing style. But again, that coupled with your shooting style is what makes who, what makes you who you are as an artist. And that will, you'll feel confident because you'll know who you are. You don't feel confident or you're sort of not self-aware when you're not sure what you like or who you are or what direction you're headed. I'm very decisive. I'm very sure of who I am, which leads to confidence. I have competence from years of experience and you'll get there. It's just going to take time. I hope that you found that helpful. That was from Dana. Those were both really good, thoughtful questions. Stella says, off camera flash. How do you know when to use it? And when would you have your flash on top of the camera versus off camera? And this is a good question. People ask me all the time, um, when would I use off camera flash? Or when should I use this particular lens over this lens? And I have, I think, a really good answer for this. Are you ready for it? When you need it. <laughs> Isn't that thoughtful? When do I use off, off camera flash? When I need it, when I need light. That's when I use it, when I need to fill in shadows on a face or light a subject because it's too dark. That's when I use it. Okay, when do I use off versus on? I really have three different, three different combinations for this flash scenario. Good morning, Ashley. Thank you for joining us. Three different scenarios for the flash. I either have one on camera, I have one off camera, or I have one on and off camera. And it really depends on what I'm shooting and what I need. Receptions for me are one on camera and two off camera in order to provide the light that I want for the look I'm going for. When I am shooting outside, I did a mentoring session last week. We worked with off camera flash, single, one flash off camera at 12 noon. And we were in sort of a shaded wooded area where it's a little bit darker, but we produced amazing results from one flash off camera. And we had a modifier on that flash and we practiced with different angles and where the light's coming from. It depends on directionality. Where do you want light? Where do you want shadows? How do you want to shape that light? Depends on what you need. I think the best thing, how do you know what you need? Well, you don't know until you practice. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Get, I would start with one flash. I would practice with it on my camera. And you know, a, a big girl flash, I call it. Not the flash that's on your camera that pops up. It's too small. I would get a flash, a real flash. I would put it on my camera and I would practice with it. Then I would get some pocket wizards or some type of trigger, I don't care what you use, and get it off camera and guess what? I would practice with that and I would grab any subject I could who was willing and practice outdoor practice indoor I would have the flash you know near them at an angle I would have it over here I would have it up I would have it down I would modify it with different modifiers small soft boxes etc I would practice with all of those so you can determine what the capabilities are so what capabilities I have coupled with what my needs are for the shot my goal for the shot will produce an answer for me that tells me, okay, you need to use on camera and off camera or just one or the other. So it really depends on what you're going for and what you need. Probably, 
I mean, I'm hoping in the next couple of months we'll be able to work at Camera Club with some off-camera flash. We did it last year. Um, we've done it for several years, just periodically. Uh, June, July are planned. Maybe later in the summer or towards the fall. I'm not quite sure yet. But what I'd like to do is work with some off-camera flash in the evening at Camera Club just to play around. You just have to play around with it. And by the way, it does not take a huge investment to get a very simple one light setup off of your camera, sub $500 actually. Um, I could get you some exact numbers in which I'll put that together, but you could do it fairly inexpensively and get amazing results. One light off the camera with some type of modifier. Brooke says, I would love to learn more about off camera flash. Yeah, it's beautiful. We, like I said a moment ago, we shot at noon outside with off camera flash and filled in shadows and it did not look like we were using a flash. That was the name of the game with these photos. If I'm doing portraits with flash on or off camera, I don't want it to look like I'm using a flash. I just want it to look really good. Now, a discerning eye might be able to look at that photo and say, oh, she was definitely using flash, that's fine. But I don't want any obvious signs that I'm using flash either on or off camera. So if I, um, if and when, it'll happen. I set that up for Camera Club, of course I'll announce it. Um, and by the way, Camera Club is free, so stop being so cheap. If you want free lessons and free mentoring, I offer it every single month at the same time for the last four years, maybe four and a half years. <laughs> so join me or not, but don't complain you don't know how to use off-camera flash when I'm gonna teach it to you for free. All right. So that was from Stella. Leslie says, my website renewal domain through GoDaddy is coming up. What exactly do I get? Uh, I don't know without looking at your account, but I feel like I don't have the right combo of products. I currently get the domain and their website builder, but I'm not super happy with it. I know lots use WordPress, but it's also confusing to me as to what to get. I'm embarrassed to admit that I haven't touched my website in over a year. Leslie, please don't be embarrassed. The reason you haven't touched your website is because you don't understand it. And I steer away from things I don't understand as well. If you saw a video I did last week, I said I avoid things in direct proportion to my ignorance of them. <laughs> so if I don't understand something, I avoid it. That's what I do. And that's what you're doing. Okay, let me start by saying at a high level, GoDaddy purchasing your domain name is your www.photographyname.com. That is your domain name. That gets you nothing but a name, nothing else. Then you purchase hosting. So I have my hosting account through GoDaddy. So hosting is like their computers with all of your files on it. So that's the hosting. And then you have to build a website there. Okay, there are a hundred thousand ways to build a website, but you need a domain name, number one, high level, and you need a hosting account. And then from there is probably where you get confused. So the way I like to instruct most people to keep it as simple as possible is you have your www.name.com, you have hosting through GoDaddy, and you install the free WordPress platform. WordPress is nothing more than a platform in order to build your website. Very simple. So I have my name, my hosting, my platform, those three things. At that point, you could go into your WordPress site, your back end login, and customize it, make it pretty, right? Change the colors, change the fonts, add your logo, Etc. And you could do that fairly inexpensively. I set up a website for someone a couple weeks ago and it cost her exactly $12 to do all of those steps. I happen to find a really good promo code for GoDaddy. By the way, don't ever pay full price at GoDaddy. Search for a promo code or call me because I'm always finding these ones that are, I mean the lowest is probably 10 to 20% off, but the last one I found was 90% off. So that's why that was only $12. She bought her domain name for the year plus hosting for the year. Now, typically the price of those, a domain will probably cost anywhere between $9 and $15 per year. Hosting, economy hosting, is $4.99 per month. So about $5 a month, about $60 a year. So for $70 a year, $70 to $75 a year, you can have a website. And it can be a very simple WordPress website that you make look pretty. 
Now, the thing is, you're not going to be happy with that because most people aren't. This is very basic. Then you need to purchase, or you can find for free, some type of template to make it pretty. So that would be things like Pro Photo, or you can go to the Envato Market, or you can go to, I use Elegant Themes, the Divi theme is what I use on the Flourish Academy. Uh, Weddings by Heather is a pro photo site. I mean, there are all different types of sites or places that create themes that make it look pretty. Uh, the real question is, do you have more time or money? That is always the question. So I would much rather look for a theme that I love, pay for it, install it, and be done. And then just add my logo and my text set. You can build this out on your own. You can find templates that are free. You can scour the internet and spend countless hours finding free templates. There are definitely good ones out there. You can spend $20 on a template through the creative market, which I love. I have a lot of photographer clients that use the creative market templates. We install them. They're great. And you have to have a little bit of WordPress knowledge in order to do that. But guess what? You have access to the Google and the YouTube, so you can learn it. It's not hard. You just don't know it yet so you fear it but it's not hard you can learn anything if you can read and watch youtube videos you can learn or you can spend several hundred dollars on a really tight customized theme that you install and then you know add your logo etc so again to recap you purchase your domain name which is your dot com name you purchase some type of hosting i happen to use godaddy for all this i know some of you use bluehost i care not I've just been with GoDaddy for about 13 years. I'm familiar with that platform and their customer service has been amazing for me. So I stick with them. So you have your .com, your hosting, and then you can install WordPress for free through GoDaddy, for free. The WordPress platform is free. You can do it in GoDaddy's console when you're logged into the back end. And then you just need to decide if you want to pretty it up with a template. I hope that helps, Leslie. Let me know if you have any other questions and uh, we'll take it from there. And if you have, a, oh, Shelly, hi Shelly. She says, I am considering Square pay, Squarespace as I have heard it is good for photographers and the domain name I want is not available. .net is reasonable, good alternative, and is Squarespace a good host? I've heard some good things about Squarespace, Shelly, but I don't use them personally, so, I can't say for sure what that looks like. Um, I mean, you could look into it and check it out and see. I'm sure that they have good options. I would look at the pricing. I would look at the templates. Is it SEO friendly? I'm sure that it is, <clears throat> but you just have to look into that because I'm not as familiar with Squarespace as I am with creating my own site through something like GoDaddy or through Bluehost. Colleen says, I need tips on how to get photos that are less posed and more natural. I am clueless in this area. Everything I do is posed, and although I know some posing has its place, I want more natural, <coughs> excuse me, and not so much posed. So people will often say, I've, I've had this happen, they'll look at my photos and they'll say, your clients look like they're having so much fun and it looks really natural and relaxed. And you know why that is? Because I'm having fun and I'm natural and relaxed. You are a mirror for your clients. Hi Aunt Cynthia, I'm glad that you're here. Leanne just says she uses a lot of prompts for this. So I learned a lot of this sort of flow, natural posing from your vaunt and from Jerry Gohinas. And they just, they say things, they engage people using their, their effervescent personalities and it causes a reaction. So what Leanne is saying by prompts is you can talk to someone and get them to talk with you and converse. Jerry does this thing where he'll have the bridal party and he'll say, he'll get everybody really serious and he'll pose them how he wants based on the light and he'll take a serious shot and then he'll say, okay, right now I want you to grab the person's bum next to you as hard as you can. Ready, set, go. And he says it really fast and with a lot of energy and they crack up. And some of them actually do it and it's really funny. So Leanne just said, you have to give people something to do. And if you're kind of slow and stiff, and you're not engaging your client, they're not going to be 
engaged with you. You have to give them something to do. So I will pose, I'll get a shot, and then I'll say, hey, can you guys walk over there? Walk over there, just hold hands, just walk away from me. Now walk back towards me, have a conversation, talk. You just have to be engaging. You have to use your personality. If you don't have one, by the way, I know Colleen personally, she does have a personality. I'm not speaking to her specifically, so everybody relax. But if you don't have a personality, you might ought to go buy one because it really matters. You are a mirror to your client. What you are getting on the other side is a direct reflection of your energy and your attitude. If you've ever shot with me, you have seen me super high energy because it gets the client excited. And then they're moving and it's very natural and they're not stiff and they're not bored. So in order to get them to look natural, you have to be natural. And you have to give them something to do so that it's more relaxed. I tend to mix it up. I tend to mix up the posing versus the relaxed, candid shots because it keeps things just fluid and moving. So hopefully that helps. Jessica asks, what is the quickest way to move my focal point? She uses Nikon. I feel like there's got to be some shortcut that you would know. It seems like there's so much of a delay and I'm usually switching from looking through the viewpoint eyepiece to the live view back to the eyepiece just to be able to move, reset it again. So maybe I'm missing something. Uh, Jessica, I will say this. In general, this is my personal opinion. Everyone needs to stop using the live view. Your photos will improve tomorrow if you stop with the live view. This has just been my experience working with photographers. Your focus points, your shutter speed, your sharpness will all improve if you use the viewfinder versus the live view. This is not for everyone. If you're using a live view and it works for you, by all means, I am just saying experience has shown me that your photos will be better if you use the eyepiece. Now, if you're looking through the eyepiece in Nikon, you can press your multi-select dial in order to move the focus point where you want it. So some people get really fast at this, but you should you don't need to look at it on your live view. You look at it through your eyepiece and move it to where you want it. I am a little bit slow with that, moving my focus point. I do use that sometimes. However, this is my style of shooting. Whatever works for you is fine. I tend to put my focus point in the center and never move it. And I focus, recompose when I am using single servo focus mode. You cannot focus, recompose with continuous servo focus mode because it will grab the background and it continuously hunts for a focus. So focus recompose only works in single servo. So I press the button halfway to lock a focus, center focus point, my subject is directly in the center, boom, lock the focus, ever so slightly recompose to place the subject where I want them and then take the photo. That's faster for me. My friend David Burke is really good at moving his focus points. He's like, boo, 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 boo. he can move them really quickly. So that works for him. It just depends on how you shoot. Jessica says, I do not shoot live view. I use it to reset the points because it doesn't move quickly enough with the eyepiece. I would need to look at that. It should move instantly. You, when you're looking through there and you're moving it, there should not be a delay. So um, next time I see you, let me play with your camera a little bit, but that shouldn't happen. So you shouldn't have to use live view for that. So we'll have to take a look, but you can either move those focus points with your thumb through the eyepiece or you can focus recompose. She says, I don't think I explained what my problem is. <laughs> I'll show you next time at Camera Club. Please forgive me if I misunderstood. Ah, I hate when I do that. I'm sorry, Jessica. Yeah, um, let's talk about that further. Okay. Jennifer says, this is a basic question, but something I struggle with. What do you use to get to set your white balance? So there are a couple of different ways to do that. My friend Nicole Bagley is excellent with setting her white balance. She uses a gray card. She takes a photo. Nicole's a pet photographer. If you're not sure or if you've not heard of her, check out Hair of the Dog blog or Nicole Bagley Photography. She is amazing. She's in the Pittsburgh area. She uses a gray card for every session. She takes a photo of that gray card and she sets her white balance according to that. Some people use the white balance settings, so they'll change it you know, from auto white balance to say outdoor, cloudy, or sunny, or indoor, or whatever, in order to balance the light. Some people set it to a specific number in Kelvin because they know what they're looking for. So there are a variety of ways to do that. It depends on your style of shooting and what the problem is. So my question would be, 
Well, what's the goal? The goal is to get a, a well white balanced photo, but how you go about that kind of turns into a personal preference. So a lot of people that shoot portraits or shoot studio will adjust their white balance on the shoot. I gotta tell you something, Heather equals simple. I leave mine in auto white balance all the time. No, not because I'm lazy. I could change it. I know how to change it, but because it's just faster and easier for me to correct it in Lightroom. For instance, if I take a photo in Heinz Chapel, which I have worked in extensively, I know that venue like the back of my hand, I could, I could probably auto set that white balance in the chapel. Maybe I should try it. But I go into Lightroom, I fix one photo, and then I sync the rest from the ceremony. So it really doesn't take me any time. I could do it there. Um, my white balance, I feel, changes a lot, even in that venue, but specifically if I'm outdoor, if I'm shooting this direction, the white balance is going to be different when I shoot this direction. So I leave mine in auto and I correct it that way. That does not work for everyone. Some people change their white balance at the session. I will tell you this straight to your face. If I were a studio photographer, you had better believe I would have the most perfect white balance in camera because it wouldn't change. I would dial it in perfectly every single time and then not have to worry about it. But I'm an on location, more portrait type photographer. So I leave it in auto. Oh, I don't know if you like that answer, but that's how I do it. Christy says, I'm moving and I'm sad to leave this amazing group. Well, you don't have to leave the group, Christy, because we have, we have the internet, so you can stay in. But happy, I'm going to be at the beach. I'm wondering where I start building my business all over again. I was just starting to get busy and lots of referrals. Christy, this should be actually pretty straightforward and easy for you because you just started building your business last year here because you moved here recently. So just do that again. <laughs> you just did it. You just have to meet people. You have to shoot. You have to put yourself out there. You have to get involved in the community. I know that you will be very involved in your church. That's a great place to start. Take your camera everywhere. Start photographing people. You can do it. You just did it. You know how. It's not any different. You just have to meet people. You have to photograph. You have to practice, practice, practice. You have to network and you'll be fine. No problem. Mary says, when delivering web size images to clients, what adjustments do you make on your raw file? Can you share specifics in regards to quality and size? Do you always adjust size quality in Lightroom and then export, or do you just use the web size option that Pixie Set offers for clients? Is there a difference between the two? Do you use the same web size settings for your clients, or would you adjust? Oh my goodness, this is a multi part question. I think I'll start back at the beginning. She says, what adjustments do you make to your raw file? Okay, what I do first is I edit all of my photos. I export them from, this is my method, from Lightroom to my external hard drive, high res for print. I take some of those images into Photoshop for further retouching if needed. I then import those finished JPEGs back into Lightroom. So in Lightroom, I have my client last name and I have their raw files and then I have a subfolder of all of their JPEGs that have been processed. And by the way, if this sounds confusing, I actually have a free video series on the Flourish Academy website. Just go to flourish.academy and there is a button. It says, do you need help organizing your photos? Yes, go watch those videos because I explain this more. But I bring that back into Lightroom. I rename the files so I have these beautiful finished JPEGs, high res. I then export those low res in order to deliver to the client. Now hold on, there's a little bit of a caveat here. Those settings for me are 1000 pixels on the long edge at 72 DPI with a quality of 80 in the export settings of Lightroom. However, if you are using Pixie Set, then you don't need to do that because all you need to do is upload your high res files to Pixie Set and they have a web option where they automatically convert those files to a low res for web for you and for the client. So it depends on your goal, the desired outcome, and where you're headed with those files. So Pixie Set will do that for you. If you are delivering the client the files via USB or something like Dropbox, then I would deliver two sets of files to the client, high res for them to print if they purchase that, 
And then the low res for web that has my watermark on it, very subtle and nice watermark, whether you do that or not is up to you, with those low quality settings in order to compress the file size. So hopefully that helps. Let me read the rest of that question because it was multiple parts. Do you use the same website settings for clients that you would on your professional website or do you further adjust? Um, I am all about efficiency, so I would not do multiple sets of this. I would find out what works best for my website, for Facebook, and I would just one set, just one set. No, I wouldn't do multiple sets. I saw someone mention JPEG Mini. I never heard of that option. I was curious how that compares to how you would normally save for the web. I looked at JPEG Mini actually the other day. I downloaded the free trial, but I haven't had time to play with it. It's obviously some type of compression algorithm that makes the file smaller without losing the quality. So my method for doing that is in Lightroom, you can dial back the quality a little bit on the export settings down to say 90 instead of 100. And in Photoshop, if you're working with a JPEG, I recommend that you save it as a JPEG 10 to reduce the file size. There's no way that I could know what their program is doing in order to compress those files um, because I don't know how it was built. So it does compress them significantly and they say without reducing the quality, I have no reason not to believe them. I think it looks great. So I typically with Lightroom or Photoshop can take my files, I just did this two days ago, I can take a JPEG that was say 12 meg and usually get it down to like three or four meg and that's pretty good. And I think JPEG Mini does it even a little bit further. So, and I think it was relatively inexpensive. Somebody remember maybe $99 for the, the lightest version and then it goes up from there for batching. Um, so you can look into it. I, I don't, and I have it, I'm gonna test it. I don't know that I have a complete need for that if I'm compressing these files enough to get the file size that I want. So, I don't know, Mary. Um, definitely check that out. Stephanie says, Lightroom question. I'm editing in Lightroom and then export to a file on my desktop. Every so often, I move those files to my external hard drive. When I go back into Lightroom, all of those question marks are there. How do I clean these up? Stephanie? Please stop doing that. Please stop sending your files to your desktop all over the place. My head is literally about to explode. I would not, you're moving files everywhere and Lightroom can't find them. You need a system and a process. I have mine outlined for free on my website. If you go check out Flourish.academy, you will find information on this. You need to keep a consistent system where you're not moving files around like that. So my files get copied from my card to my external hard drive in a folder that I created with the client last name under the month. I then import those raw files into Lightroom, work on them. I then export them out into a subfolder for the high-res printable JPEGs, work on those further. I then deliver those to the client. They never move, ever. My files never move. So guess what never happens to me? I never get little question marks. Lightroom never says to me those question marks or exclamation points on different versions. They say to you, hey, I can't find that file. See, I had a connection to that file and you moved it and now I don't have it. And then you have to reconnect the file in order for Lightroom to find it. Now, every so often, if you need to say, purchase a new external hard drive and move a big lump of images and reconnect them, that's fine. That does happen, but it's pretty rare. So you should, you just need to develop a system. How? Well, I'll have mine for free on my website, but you could also just write it out on paper. How do I want that to look? You have got to stop putting files on your desktop or anywhere on your internal hard drive. For you, that would be your C drive or your D drive. No, no, no. You need to always keep all of these images on the external hard drive. Now, I imagine there's a reason that you're doing that because I don't think you would just do it. Maybe you think it's faster or you can find it or it's more convenient, but it's not. And you can find it and keep things in order. Now, I've seen your laptop, so I know about this desktop issue. We have talked about this. 
I know you know how to put them on your hard drive and keep them there. No desktop, no. It sounds like I'm scolding you, I'm not. I care about you and I care about your photos and I don't want you to lose them and I don't want you to see question marks. <laughs> so that's what you're gonna do, right? Are you awesome with that? I see you there. Um, and if you need help, I will help you. I will be glad to do that. Those were all of the questions that you asked there. I decided this morning as I was getting ready, I wanted to do something really fun. Hey Katie, thank you. Katie says my workflow is awesome. Thank you so much. So I was reading through these questions and there were some really good questions this week and I thought, wouldn't it be fun if every week I picked one question that was my favorite and whoever posted that question gets a free 20 minute mentoring one-on-one -on -one phone call? Huh? Would that be awesome? I think that would be great fun. So um, how would I pick my favorite question? For me, my favorite question is one that I really have to think about that challenges me or that I think is really important to your success. So you can't, I mean, I can't even predict what questions I'm gonna pick because I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's, it's probably gonna be one that makes me think. If there's a question that makes me think, wow, that's a really good question, then that's probably gonna be my favorite. So I have my favorite for this week. I'm gonna start this week because why not? I came up with this idea about five minutes ago and I am a person of action and decision. I just make things happen. So every week, the Q&A, you post questions. One person will be selected, whoever posts my favorite question, they'll get a free 20 minute phone call, mentoring, um, whatever you want me to help you with. I can help you with your pricing, your website, your photos, uh, your workflow, your file management system, Stephanie. My favorite question was this week I bet you can guess if you've been on this video the entire time I'm gonna pull up my favorite question my favorite question this week was from Dana Dana Ray said what's a goal you didn't reach how did you adjust that goal for the next year month etc I loved that question I thought it was very thoughtful and so Dana's gonna have a free 20 minute phone call mentoring session one-on-one -on -one within the next week so I didn't see her jump on today but I will contact her and let her know and I'll post about this in the group so everyone is aware so every week when I post for the Q&A um, ask some questions and ask some good ones because you could get a free mentoring session isn't that awesome that is so fun I love this you guys I love helping you Q&A is my favorite time of the week. Hey, by the way, this afternoon, I'm going to be at YM Camera around 1 p.m. I'm helping a new photographer friend of mine pick out a camera. She has a digital rebel, I'm pretty sure, from 1922. No, okay. She's had this digital rebel, I think she said, for about 12 years. Digital rebel, 12 years. So I'm meeting her at YM Camera to help her pick out a new camera. Won't that be so fun? And um, this is not like part of a mentoring session. I'm just hanging out because I think it's fun. So if you're in the area and you wanna meet me at YM Camera this afternoon and ask me something, I will be there. My goal is to be there about once a month, maybe a little bit more, where I'm just there for a few hours so you can stop by. I wanna get on their regular schedule. I talked with Robbie about this. So we're gonna implement this pretty soon. I'll just be there once a month where you can come in and ask questions about gear and ask them because they are incredibly knowledgeable. So between them and myself, we can get you all set up. I hope you have a great weekend. I'll talk to you soon.